until he had made an end of building his own house in the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Second Chronicles 8, verse 11. And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David into the house which he had built for her. But he said, My wife should not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereof the ark of the Lord hath come. Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 12. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked. Besides that which she burned to the king. So she turned and went to her own land, she and her servant. This union with Egypt and Cush was so strong that during the siege of Nebuchadnezzar, Egypt even tried to fight and protect Judah from Babylon. Jeremiah 37, verses 1 and 5 through 7. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. Then Pharaoh's army came forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans besieged Jerusalem, heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus should you say to the king of Judah, that sent you unto me, inquire of me. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt in their own land. Now, if Israel had allies who would fight for them, and also, there were already Hebrews in Ethiopia and Egypt. Plus, the Roman garrisons were to the north of them. Why would they flee north? Isaiah 11, 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover a remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. So we know that the Hebrews would run to Assyria and to Shinar in the Babylonian and Assyrian captivities. The other locations, Syria, Pathros, and Egypt, which is northern and southern Egypt, and Cush. Remember, there were Hebrews in Cush before 70 AD, for one. Also notice how the Most High named Cush along with Egypt. So if the Hebrews were already in Cush, which is East Africa, why would it be a stretch that they would migrate west? But one would say, God didn't say that they migrated west. So they didn't live in West Africa. Well, let's take a look and see if the Most High said anything about them being west of Cush. In 3, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, Cush, my supplants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring my offering. And that day... Shalt thou not be ashamed of all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me? But then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of thy holy mouth. Pretty interesting. It says that the dispersed of Israel are beyond the rivers of Cush. Hmm. I thought it was only in Europe and in Asia. Now let's take a closer look at this scripture. Beyond Eber, a region across on the opposite side. So let me get this straight. The Most High said that the dispersed of Israel are in the opposite side of the rivers of Cush. Wow. So what's the opposite side of East Africa? Hey, that would be West Africa. Get out of here. Who would have thought? Hey. I wonder if anybody else knew about these Hebrews being in West Africa. In the year 65 BC, the Roman armies under General Pompey captured Jerusalem. In 70 AD, General Vespasian and his son, Titus, put an end to the Jewish state with great slaughter. During the period of the military governors of Palestine, many outrages and atrocities were committed against the residue of the people. During the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa, fleeing the Roman persecution and slavery. The slave markets were full of black Jewish slaves. From Babylon and Timbuktu, by Rudolf R. Windsor. The 16th century historian and traveler, the young Africanist, was a Hebrew-speaking Jewish convert to Islam, raised in a Jewish household by Jewish parents of Moroccan descent. The young Africanist traveled extensively in Africa south of the Sahara, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. Let me say it again, where he encountered innumerable black African Jewish communities. 
Leon later converted to Catholicism, but remained interested in Jewish communities where he encountered throughout his travels in West Africa. This is a quote from his book, The Description of Africa. Albeit, they say that upon the Nihilus, or the Nile, you will have two great and populous nations. One of Jews toward the West, under a government of a mighty king. Leo Africanus, The Description of Africa, Volume 1, page 32. Ibn Kulan, who lived in the 13th century, a respected authority on Berber history, testified the black Jews of Western Sudan, with whom he personally interacted. Also, the famous Muslim geographer El Drisi, born in Celta, Spain, in the 12th century, wrote extensively about Jewish Negroes in the Western Sudan. Black Jews were fully integrated and achieved preeminence in many West African kingdoms. For instance, the Jews were believed to have settled in great West African empires such as Songhai, Mali, Ghana, and Kanembarno empires. According to numerous accounts of contemporary visitors to the region, several rulers and administrators of the Songhai Empire were of Jewish origins until Askia Mohammed came to power in 1492 and decreed that all Jews either convert to Islam or leave the region. Some accounts place some West African Jewish community in the Ondo Forest of Nigeria, south of Timbuktu. This community maintained a Torah scroll as late as the 1930s, written in Aramaic, that had been burnt into a parchment with a hot iron instead of ink, so it could not be changed. See, going with Pika, the quest of the lost ten tribes of Israel to the ends of the earth. This quote is from the travels of Ludovico di Barmita in Egypt, Syria, Arabia Desert, and Arabia Felix in Persia, India, and Ethiopia, A.D. 1503-1508. At the end of eight days, we found a mountain which appeared to be 10 or 12 miles in circumference, in which mountain there dwell four or 5,000 Jews who go naked and are in height five or six spans and have a feminine voice and are more black than any other color. They live entirely on the flesh of sheep and eat nothing else. They are circumcised and confess that they are Jew. These quotes are from the earth and its inhabitants, the universal geography by Elise Bacoulis. The Mandegans were now broken up into many rival petty states or excellent husbandmen, but displayed their remarkable talents chiefly as traders. They have been compared to the Sirocles, the Jews of West Africa. This quote is from Hebrews, Hebrew exiles from Israel, amazing facts and revelations. The first British explorers who met the Hebrews of Nigeria were quick to identify them as a branch of Hebrews based in 1930.